As one of my economics professors once said, for every market that exists for the higher end goods, there will be at least three or four other markets for the lower end goods. Something not necessarily badly made, but less expensive. Hello everybody, it's the Alco Diesel Guy, and as you probably guessed by my intro, today's review we're going at the lower end, how to get started in model railroading very inexpensively. This is one of the bargain basement style train sets that existed back in the 90s and 80s and into the 2000s to a certain extent. And as we see by this little label over here, it is the no is the model power train set number 1020. Very basic train set with very basic equipment, somewhat decontented. But then again, considering how low the price point is, again, $25 all the way up to around 50, closer to 100 and some of the less, shall we say, Scroogey company, shall we say. Again, this was something that was associated with Christmas, so you have to understand the association. Again, they could be had anywhere from a grocery store to your local pharmacy. And these were essentially in production long term, somewhere all the way back from the 80s, all the way through to the early 2000s. In fact, I think all the way through until the point MRC took model power over somewhere in 2014. Anyway, let's get right to it and take a good look at what the set has to offer. Again, these low-end sets were there to try to get people who weren't in the hobby into it, get them into building layouts, working on locomotives, etc., and collecting in general. As we can see by the packaging, it's very basic, and that kind of fills the sort of theme going on here. Everything was done to keep the cost down. It's a very basic plastic box. Although, if we take a look at the top here, and this is something I must point out, again, the set showing this was, in fact, a later production one, says very clearly it is, it is directed to people no younger than 14 years old. The reason being is that, of course, in model railroading is now considered something not appropriate for children due to the small parts and the fact that it utilizes electricity. I'll do a video on this if anyone has any questions on this, as there seem to be a lot of questions and concerns about that general rule. I was too when I heard about it, and I'm more than happy to do the content if anyone's interested. Just post a comment, and I will get into that. Anywho, let's go ahead and open this set up and see what she has to offer. As we can see on the top of the set, there are two plastic whatchamahoosies locks things. We need to release those to get the plastic box itself open. The instructions do mention using caution to cut this package apart, although I found I could just pull these tabs out to get it free. Please note if you are going to cut, cut the plastic, please be careful as it can scratch you pretty badly. This is, while not the thickest plastic, it's still strong enough to do some major damage if you're not careful. We also know that this has been in storage for a while as we see the rubber band on that track has actually literally disintegrated, as we'll find as I open this up as there's nothing holding that track in place anymore. Luckily, everything seemed to arrive just fine. After removing some tape, the package can then be simply opened and we can get a good look at the contents inside. To start with, let's take a good look at the locomotive. As we see, it's a very small one. This is part of a class of locomotives known in America as a critter. And no, it has no relationship to a specific television show's Christmas special. This particular locomotive was produced by the Plymouth Locomotive Works, and they were designed strictly for small industrial companies that and or small railroads that didn't have the cash to really buy a full-on locomotive or didn't want to spend the money on a full-on locomotive switcher, etc. As we can see through the cab, the motor is mounted literally vertically down facing the wheel set, and we'll see exactly why in a second. The detailing itself on the locomotive in general is crude, not even plastic for the windshields. And as we see on the underside, the motor's output shaft literally has a worm gear attached to it, which in turn drives the gear on that rear wheel set, and that's all it has, is two-wheel drive. The wheels are brass, and the front wheel set is a collector. The, wheel, the rear wheel set also does function as a collector too, so it does have essentially all-wheel pickup for what little it's worth. This particular oil can, as they're called, which is an oil tank car, is manufactured by Mantua, or at least used to be, before Model Power bought their tooling and put it in their train sets. Nice little feature. It actually has sprung couplers, which we'll see a little bit closer in a little while. Next, we'll move on to the Jersey Gold box car. I believe this to have been made by Mihano. I don't believe that was actually Mantua. It has the symbol of an old railroad that went out of business a while ago. I can't remember the name. Someone please feel free to post that in the comments. Interestingly enough, showing you how random these bits were thrown together, it does not have the sprung coupler unlike what we saw in the, and saw in the Mantua oil can. This one, and as we also see, one of the wheel sets is out of shape. This is a common problem in particular with plastic wheel sets. If you do get a set like this and it happens, it's no big deal. Simply spread the, two si the side frames of the truck itself and place the wheel back into position. This can be a little frustrating, but the trick is to keep your patience and go nice and slow and you'll get it eventually. It's a good skill to learn, as with these cars, this will happen occasionally on your line, especially if you have a wreck, unfortunately. With the wheel set successfully back in place, let's get a good look at the coupler, which again is not sprung and has that infamous plastic sprung coupler. Again, this is due to the randomness of how Model Power kind of put its sets together with other people's parts, kind of picking and choosing. It did give a nice variety, but this is one of the weird quirks that we run into. I will say this coupler did work for what I needed it for. It held it together well when I tested the train set, but still a kind of unusual quirk considering the rest of the cars did have it. Did have that actual detail in, in themselves, that little spring there, which does make a huge difference in keeping the cars together on the tracks. 
And here's another interesting detail. You actually see the ice hatches on the top. Again, this is an old school refrigerator car. Ice literally used to cool these things, folks. Same really nice detail considering the low endness of this train set. Now let's take a look at the caboose itself. And I believe this is actually also made by Mahano. As we see, it actually has metal railings on either side. Been on the crude side in terms of the detailing. We also see that it has the the chimney on the top and really nothing much else. It's very light. It doesn't have much in terms of quality control. The couplers themselves, I noted, are slightly bent on one side. I don't know exactly what caused that to happen. Most either a problem with assembly or most likely maybe from sitting in the package it got a little warped. I was able to make this work by simply turning the engine around, turning the caboose around, pardon me, and using the opposite side. It worked just fine that way. And now let's dive further into this package. Right over here we have the instructions, which also contains the terminal track wire. And below that we have the transformer. Let's take a good look at the instructions first. And as we can see by the terminal wires, they are the bare bones basic clip styles. They have to be screwed down and placed on the transformer. And yes, this does use the rather infamous spring-loaded clamps for the wires themselves to the track. And here's the transformer. It's very, very basic. Model Powers are making this for years. I think this is, I think mm -hmm. at the time this model was produced, it was at least 15 years old. It does the trick, though. Very basic control. Reverse forward could switch on the right. Throttle on the back there. I actually kind of like how that throttle comes up. It looks realistic, almost like a real locomotive in that regard. The voltage is kind of all over the place. I think the box said 16. It says 19. Don't know who to believe. <laughs> anyway, let's move on to the tracks themselves. These tracks, as we can see, are in fact bare bones, standard HO scale track. They're steel alloy, nothing really much to them. According to the back, they're manufactured by a company called Grant GT, which I believe was short for Gran Turismo. It's an Italian manufacturer that made tracks for quite some time. I never, I'm not exactly sure whether Model Power bought the tooling and was manufacturing them under a license, or whether they were buying them from GT. I think they bought them from GT and brought them in. To reiterate again, these are very basic tracks, and just to show you how basic they are, here's the power track, and it's a, or terminal track as they're known, and as we see, it doesn't even have a railer on it, and it does use, as you see there, the clamps to put the wires in. These were rather infamous back in the day, as you could easily cross the wires, which in turn would lead to a short, and if you weren't careful, some smoke, or even something worse, so please be very wary of this if you're going to buy this set. Now, while it seemed like Model Power may have been alone in this segment, they weren't. As we can see here, Toys R Us was in on the act. They had the Toys R Us Express set. This is one of them right here. And for my younger viewers out there, if you're wondering why the heck would Toys R Us be in this segment of the market, well, just listen to one of their jingles and you'll know. One of the things they mention is trains. And then we also have the other fact that trains were at the time considered for children. Now, of course, the age is 14 years and up. So it made perfect sense for the company to actually carry these sets. And they had a deal with Lifelike where they kept the price down on them to get kids into them. I used to get, I got one of these almost once a year at one point when I was a kid. This particular version is a newer version that still kept the ridiculously low $25 price point. It did this though by using old school horn hook couplers. It did provide a slightly better locomotive and it utilized the power lock track which certainly helped out. And it had a sa safer system of connecting the wires up to the tracks. Not quite as easy as the easy track plug but not nearly as bad as the aging prehistoric clamps which by that point had been phased out even by lifelike. But overall, this train set was insane value for money, and it kept the train sort of fever going for kids like myself, the few that still existed that were into trains at the time. Anyway, let's get to the meat and potatoes and set this set up. Now, obviously, because this is not easy track or power lock, etc., we need to utilize a piece of wood to set it up on. You can try to set it up temporarily on a carpet, but I don't recommend this. It will eat lint like crazy, despite what Lifelike said on their promotion where they had back in the day that sort of joint track you could set up directly on floors. It did not work very well on carpets, and it's strongly not recommended. So anyway, I decided since it was a nice day to get outside and go ahead and set it up on my outdoor workbench, if you will, I went ahead and grabbed this piece of tack board paneling and started laying my tracks out. Ah, yes, this all comes back to me. The joys of joining the old school HO scale track, the slipping of the rail joiners, the scratches, the cuts, the... What am I talking about? Yeah. Anyway, you need to be very careful with this stuff, to put it mildly. The tracks, as you can see, do not necessarily always go together smoothly. Unfortunately, this is a very stringent requirement. If you don't join the tracks correctly, you can have a derailment or, an ira or a bad electrical connection, which will lead to bad performance. Here's a nice little shot showing you how to do it. Line the two fish plates or connectors up and gently apply pressure until they come together. And check to make sure the joining point is smooth, that there's no bump. The bump again can cause the engine to gyrate and go flying off the tracks when it strikes this area, especially at higher speeds. A bed connection again can also lead to power problems. And please do pardon that annoying background noise. Essentially, my neighbor decided it was a good idea to clean his property out and start cutting down unnecessary trees and shrubbery and, well, shred them.
With our basic circle of track now complete, we'll start to put the equipment actually on the tracks. Please note again, this train set does not even include a re-railer, so they all have to be re-railed by hand. And with the train on the track, it's now time to hook the power pack up. Again, this train set is again very basic and somewhat primitive in the way it hooks up. We have to use the old school wire clamp system. To do this in turn, we have to strip the wires, as you see me doing right there. It's very critical that you make sure they are, they are stripped down to the point where there are no stray strands like right there you see me cutting one off as this can cause a crossed wire which will in turn lead to a short. Please note the transformer slash power pack should not be plugged in yet at this point. Next we'll connect the actual terminal wires to the power pack again to the track output connections right there as we see on the power pack itself. We do this by simply unloosing the screws, slipping the hooks in place and then tightening them back up again. Please note the track terminal connections that run to the actual terminal track itself must go to the track only connection on the back of the transformer, not the AC output connections. As we can see they are very clearly marked so just make sure you hook the wires up to the right point so you have proper control of the train and you don't cause any electrical problems. With our wires correctly hooked up to the transformer, it's now time to actually connect them to the terminal track itself. Plus this after making sure we've thoroughly twisted the wire, so we simply press down on one of the clamps and then push the wire through the hole. Once the wire is through the hole, we then release the clamp and it will in turn clamp the wire in position, hence the name while well, clamp. If you plan to keep this set up for a while and you are handy with a soldering iron, my advice would be to actually dip the tip of the wire, the naked section I should say, into some flux and go ahead and apply a little solder to it. This will in turn make it easier to clamp in position, avoid the possibility of a crossed wire, and at the same time make sure it stays clamped more securely. And now we're finally ready to get her moving, we simply lift the throttle up on the transformer and away she goes. The locomotive is extremely crude with rough detailing and a very basic drive setup, which is itself crude and a very inexpensive motor, causing it to make a noise noticeable buzzing whining noise as it runs. All that said, it does the job. It is able to pull along very nicely, and the cars do a good job of staying on the track despite having the plastic wheels. And also, despite the fact that the boxcar is equipped with a non-sprung coupler, it doesn't let go. Something I'm very impressed with, especially considering that, as you can see by this layout, which was a later attempt, is much more level than the previous one I had, set up for this example. Now for those of you who are new to model railroading and are wondering the difference between a two-wheel drive locomotive like this one, and a, an, say, eight-wheel drive locomotive like the ones I've previously reviewed, well, let me show you on the previous variation of this layout that I set up. It should become immediately apparent as to why I didn't go with these shots as my main of the train set running. We also see the limitations of this particular locomotive. The critter, as we see, is not good at handling hills or grades, as we call them, very well at all. It just kind of struggles its way up and actually hesitates quite a bit around there. If I'm honest, I'm actually maneuvering the layout to keep it from stalling out. Contrast this with the CSX GP15 locomotive from the Walters trains that I most recently reviewed, and we can see that there's a huge difference. The Walters locomotive has no trouble at all extending the grades, it doesn't hesitate in the slightest. All this said, however, the critter engine does its job for the basic trains that this is, and for a model railroad with a simple leveled layout, it'll be a fine locomotive. Track, because it's composed of steel alloy, will require more maintenance, but it gets the job done much like everything else. Freight cars have a similar story. They are more than capable of doing the basic job of getting around the track, although again, there's nothing here to go crazy about, although the detailing is very nicely done on them, I must say. Overall, this is a very basic set and very, very ca capable of its job. Just don't expect miracles of it. But now let's take a closer look at this critter looking one of itself and see what makes it tick. As you can see, the motor is mounted inside the cab there rather crudely, and it's literally facing downward. Again, as I mentioned, the worm gear is literally attached to the output shaft, which in turn makes direct contact with the drive gear on the one single drive wheel set that moves. Now, I'm not going to go too deep into this locomotive, as I happen to know their shells are very, very flimsy and very easy to break if you try to take them apart too far, so I'm just going to focus on the mechanical end, end right on the bottom here. To get in, we remove the two screws. Once the screws are out of the way, the bottom panel can simply be lifted off. Be careful as the couplers are also secured by this panel and will basically come out as well at the same time. 
As you see, the back here is there's sort, of, there's sort of a lip that actually hangs on and holds the rear panel in place. To get this out, we simply apply gentle pressure and pull it back. We can now get a good look at the under, under workings of this particular locomotive, and as we see, the grease is kind of old. Again, there are our wheels, again, in brass. The pickup, uh, pickup system is, again, via wheel wipers, which, is, which are located right behind the wheel sets themselves. Really nothing much to see here. It's a very, very basic locomotive. But that actually is part of the appeal of this locomotive setup. Basically, there are two wires that run power to either one of the wheel wipers, which in turn power the motor itself, making it very easy to repair this locomotive if it runs into a problem. Finding parts, though, exactly for this engine might be a bit of a challenge, though, as they have been out of production for quite some time. Anyway, let's quickly get her back together. So to sum up this train set, well, it goes by the old saying, you get what you pay for, but in this case, despite the low price, you get quite a bit. The cars are decently detailed, especially for the price. The locomotive does a respectable job, despite being extremely crude and lacking even four-wheel drive. It only has two-wheel drive and the infamous brass wheels. The cars themselves stay on the track well enough. The track itself does the trick, although it'll probably need more cleaning and more frequently to make everything work the way it should, or at least keep it running steadily. Overall, if you can find one of these, I recommend buying it. Especially if you're looking for a cheap entry point into the hobby, this will not break the bank. Now, again, if you can find it. The reason why I say that is that model power basically doesn't exist as it used to be anymore. It was acquired by MRC a few years ago. And since then, MRC has kind of backed out of producing model railroad equipment for the exception, with the exception of some locomotives with their Loco Genie package in them and a few other pro such products such as transformers and DCC systems. Some I advise peruse eBay and such another such online auction sites or even your old local hobby shop and you might just find one sitting on the shelf. If you've been looking to get into the hobby, again, buy this you won't be disappointed it'll do the trick and it'll probably really give you a lot of enjoyment for what little money you'll spend and those of you video gamers out there complaining it costs too much well this thing costs half as much as a half as much or about as much of a, as a video game depending upon where you find it so there that'll do it for this review folks if you liked it thumbs up if not thumbs down thank you for watching please subscribe and again keep the metal side down